Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful weekend, beautiful day today, too. Um, I'm Susan Couch. I'm a member of the Science, Medical, and Technology Committee, and I'm really honored to once again introduce Jerry Van Weingarten um, as our presenter today. He is a HASP member and a big HASP contributor. He at one time was the chairperson of the Science, Medical, and Technology Committee, and he was president of HASP. So he's contributed a lot in addition to all the courses he teaches for us. Um, just a little bit of background on Jerry. Um, he has a master's in geography from the University of Minnesota, a master's in education from the University of Michigan, um, a numerous things. He's been a teacher, administrator, part-time instructor here at Hope College, um, Muskegon Community College, Grand Valley State College, <laughs> Davenport University, and he was the superintendent of the Hamilton Public Schools. So we've got a real rock star here for a geography. I always enjoy his classes and I wish you the best of luck on his quizzes. So. Okay. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, we can leave the, the litany kind of go by the way, by the way. Hey, it's good to see so many people again. And uh, one of the few times that I've been able to be in this particular building. Otherwise, it's always been upstairs. You remember the upstairs. And we would crowd the room and then try to get everybody in on it. So. But I'm grateful to be here, and maybe I can not make too many mistakes. Uh, if I make a mistake, uh, uh, Ron will make sure that I'm okay. So, uh, <clears> at <throat> any rate, Russia. I hope this gives you a little bit of background on what's happening today, even though I'm not talking about today really so much as the background that you see in the geography of, of Russia. And so as a consequence, we start out with the, um, oops, wrong way, I'll figure it out eventually. We look at all of the republics that are not supposed to be a part of Russia anymore, but this is the Soviet Union. And if you understand this part a little bit, because that's the part we'll look at first, uh, you, uh, you may understand why Putin would like to have these all come back, uh, being a bit powder hungry. So we'll see once, but it, we'll let, take a look at each one and see where they fit into this whole system and why they may want to be back or may not want to be back into the Soviet Union as a, as a group. But uh, once they went on their own way, some of them liked, well, liked the fact that they are separate and particularly Ukraine. All right, so let me get started here. The 14 former members of the union, and I'll click them off here a moment and a little bit, but <clears throat> and we'll look at them, each one of them a little bit. So <clears throat> during this session, we'll look at each of the 14 members. And uh, next week, we'll look at Russia, really concentrate on the Russian area completely. So you have a map and a couple of them anyway, you may be able to flip back and forth as to where I happen to be on the, on the situation. So the Federation today, if you look at it that way anyway, it's, um, it's a vast size, largest country in the world, yeah, it experiences bitter cold, yes. In fact, <clears throat> this record was not set too long ago of 56 below. And uh, in Kresnevox, is, which is in central, central Siberia, and if you can take a look at where that's on the map, I, the one arrow shows uh, Kresnevox pretty well. And then the other one we will look at on the map is um, um, Chalonest, Chalnobisk. 
Now, if you know how to pronounce these better than I do, go, you go right ahead and tell me, okay? <laughs> uh, at any rate, record cold. Well, uh, once again, you see what I put it on this map so you can check on your own map where these places are. Siberia and the all of Russia. Well, Chaldovesk was shocked by a meteorite and that I would like to show you in a moment. The city just east of the Ural Mountains. In 1930, it had a tractor plant. Late, later, Stalin made it into a tank plant. And the city became top secret nuclear research center. Well, here is a crater, a crater that the meteorite almost hit. Actually, it exploded above the site um, several miles, but the impact it was enough of a, a bang to create a crater, even though the material itself, well, parts of the meteorite did land up in, in the area so they could find these meteors uh, and pick them up. But otherwise, the big uh, asteroid that was coming at, in at this point never hit the Earth other than this explosion above the surface, enough to create a crater. It's amazing. So tremendous power that this thing had. Nearby, in the cities nearby, the, the shock waves that happened uh, as you can see, <clears throat> we're very hard on one of the cities here and kind of blowing things apart. Well, if we move on to the Federation today, let's take a look at the impenetrable forests, lots of them. The mountainous outposts, remote frontiers, and then you get this picture. This is a climate picture. <clears throat> and if you take a look at the, this color right here, uh, kind of a greenish one, that climate is exactly the same as you would see here in the United States, in Northeast United States, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, and so forth. But above that, <clears throat> you find the, uh, well, they just simply make it a subarctic, and we'll find out that that's mostly taiga pretty soon. But, um, and above, way on the top, would be the tundra. So they have some good land for raising things, but an awful lot of land that is just too cold and too um, far away to really gain anything agricultural wise. So if you take a look then at the uh, warmer areas, uh, you have to go down into one of the satellites or one of the former ones like Kazakhstan. Uh, so at least they can have it a little bit warmer there. And notice along the edge, how many different um, of the former units are listed along the edge. And you'll see that again pretty soon. There's a section along the top, which uh, is just like North, just like Canada, really. And as you see along the top picture there, it's called the taiga, and the taiga really means a lot of forest, a lot of uh, trees. Taiga is the world's largest biome and makes up 29% of the world's forest, forest cover. The largest areas are in Russia and Canada. And the cold month temperature averages below zero. Warm month averages 66 above, so not very warm. The rainfall is slight. It's really a desert kind of rainfall. 10 inches is desert and uh, 10 to 15 inches, even though the snow can get to be very, very thick and very deep. All right. What it might look like if you're out there on the taiga, the trees, 
especially these in Russia. A little idea what the floor might look like if you're out in the trees. And the tundra is then a slip ray on the top. And that scene should show you where the tundra is. And that's less than 10 inches of rain. So what do they do in this kind of country anyway? Well, it's a desert of ice and snow. Really, it is. And so a few people, a very hardy people, do live up there in that tundra area. Not bad. Okay. And they seem to like it. <clears throat> And we'll notice that some people prefer that rather than living in some of the areas in Russia. There's a flight of people away from uh, certain areas in Russia because of the constrictions that have been imposed upon them. Nearby, <clears throat> this is kind of different anyway, is Andaletsnaya is a diamond mine. There's a city there. The, next to the diamond mine. And this diamond mine has been dug deeper and deeper. It's like a, uh, uh, a spike that goes down and they keep getting diamonds as far as they go on. That's been played out, but they have left a big hole like this as they have gone down to pick up the diamonds. Now, <clears throat> what do you do with a big hole like that? Well, um, this one guy has an idea that you might be able to use that, even though it is so far north, and maybe we should climate control it somehow. So he has an idea that uh, it has not worked out, but it's been on the books for quite a while, that they build something inside of this big thing. And building inside of it uh, is a place where they can grow vegetables and the like so that people can live up here in this north area. And uh, so if they ever make that work, I don't know, but Pavel Sipin is the guy's name. He wants to make this city. He puts a cover on it. All right, but that's not there yet because it, they never got around to make it work. Well, The size of this total area is 145 million. And that was put out in uh, April 22. It's the seventh largest in the world. 130 different ethnic groups. Wow. And here's a picture of some of the areas where the ethnic groups are. The tan area happens to be the, the Russian people um, who, who then are Caucasians. But notice they have a couple of other types in there as well. And the Fino, yeah. Ugric, and the Turkic that inhabit the land as far as the area is concerned. Well, notice that also has a, an effect on the religions that these various countries have. A little picture of where the Fino Ugric people ha happen to be. Estonia is the place where they came from and from, from Finland in those two areas and uh, populated pockets in Russia as they are today. Little picture of the population that has happened, what's happened to the population in the last several years. In 91, it was 148 million. Today it is 145. In other words, they're losing. They're losing population, as that graph tends to show there. Uh, why they are moving? Usually because of the political atmosphere, but also uh, even though it's cold, some move toward the cold, yeah, but many of them move out. So uh, that's why you find Russians in the United States and er elsewhere in the world. They get tired of what being said, done in that country. A little quick picture then of what has happened in the last years. And you can see that the 
mortality, which is the red line, is pretty well equal at this point with the fertility line. And then, uh, so as a consequence, the green line, which would be the natural increase, is going down, down as in that line. So they're losing people. And that shows up in this next one as well. So gradually getting less and less. Now, in the last year, an awful lot of people have uh, that aren't recorded have left Russia by the truckloads, I guess, as they go toward the border, especially with this business uh, beyond Ukraine. Now let's look at each one of them a little bit and uh, summarize them if we can. We're going to start out with Estonia, but let's rip through these just a moment. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Kaliningrad is a very interesting little insert in there. We'll work on that one a little bit. Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. <laughs> uh, Afghanistan is not listed in that, as you can see. That, <clears throat> that by the way, was one of the subjects that I uh, we had here at HASP, Afghanistan, the stands, we called it. And we've talked about each of the different stands and how they survived. Well, so we go from near Europe down toward Asia. Once again, look where these 14 happen to be. And if you take a look at, um, uh, I'll just point out, this one up here called Russia, is that where it is there, Russia. Uh, why is that called Russia? Well, we'll see that in a little bit because that's part of Kaliningrad. Estonia, a quick review on that. Notice it is 26% Russian. And that's significant if people want to be part of Russia. Uh, it, the religion is Estonian Orthodox or Lutheran, 34%. You can see these are the three Baltic ones, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And each one is rather important. And there you see the Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad becomes rather significant to Russia in just a little bit. Once again, take a look at it. The capital of it is, is Tillian, uh, which is not all that significant. But a Finnic people speaking Estonian language closely related to Finnish. Tapia it was built on a limestone hill. It's an old type of build, building castle, really. And it looks like that. It's now the seat of their government. It was a felt fortress for centuries before that. So the capital of itself of Estonia. Moving on to the next one is Latvia. Latvia is stuck in between that and uh, Lithuania. Now, 29% Russian, Christian churches. Hmm. Notice that these things are gonna happen, 40%. Eventually, we will see down in there that, oh, Muslims are being listed rather than Christians. So, so watch for that as we go to the next ones. But Latvia is yeah, just a nice little country. And as a, a very nice capital, as far as that's concerned, and mo modern in most ways. So it's the largest city of the Baltic states. Um, it is a seaport, a major industrial and commercial, cultural, and financial center. So 
the Latvians related to the Lithuanians, <clears throat> both are Baltic people and member of the EU. So far, both of them have been members of the European Union. Then we get Lithuania, 6% Russian, but look at the religion is still pretty high percentage of 79% Lithuania. And I ask you to take a look at Lithuania that right next to it is Belarus. And uh, then you have this little point that's called Russia uh, right there. Okay, and that is Kaliningrad. So look at, looking at Lithuania, nothing tremendously uh, different about it, but I once again point out Kaliningrad because it's so important to Russia. Lithuania does have an, a distinction. <laughs> you can find the center of Europe here, and so they put up a monument. Uh, it goes all the way from the British Isles to the Ural Mountains. So finally, they at least have a monument to being the center of Europe. And because it's, uh, they like sports, they put up a particular <coughs> um, monument, but basketball seems to be their be best sport that they like the best. So put up a monument to that. One of the cathedrals, Catholic uh, Catherine St. Catherine Church. Just <clears throat> a moment, EU member. But I'm going to make sure I cut the scoff out, okay? May <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, now we get to Kaliningrad, and notice I have two, uh, three different maps on Kaliningrad. It's just an insert into the uh, area of the Baltic, but it has a Baltic seaport, and that's why it is important to Russia. And you can see it on three different maps over here, and uh, I think you can point, find the arrows up there where that happens to be. But notice it is uh, not touching Russia at all, but it is a Russian territory. It's called a Russian exclave. The land uh, links R Russia to the main to the mainland, and as a consequence, they have to cross over Lithuania in order to get to the other part of Russia. But it's a very important port for them. And they did not want to lose that, so it remains part of Russia. This particular spot is at Kaliningrad. <clears throat> the Vistula Lagoon is important to them because they can let ships into that spot where there's a canal. And uh, that's all right. They get into the lagoon, and then they can go ahead and deposit their materials um, in the city. But... <clears throat> If you take a look at this one, just a moment, uh, that particular canal has to be used by Poland, if Poland wants to use it at all, or get anything from the Baltic, and Poland is down here. So as a consequence, the Polish decided, hey, let's build our own canal in here. And they have done so, and uh, just recently, in the last half a year anyway, they were able to put a canal in here, a very rugged looking canal, but at least they could use it. And uh, as a consequence, shorten their, <clears throat> their trip to Poland. And as you can see, you, um, the area where they put a, oops, a, a new canal, is about in here, so they can get close to their uh, city of Ebleg, 
And now as a consequence, all these cities then can be served through this particular port. And that was opened only this year, this last year, with, uh, within the last year anyway. So um, otherwise they would have to pay Russia a feed every time they went through the other canal. Again, take a look at where they can easily now go on through into Poland. Well, they changed the name of Koenigs Koenigsberg to Kaliningrad. The Germans left after World War II, and the city rebuilt on the site of the old castle. Now 78% Russian. Hmm, a seaport for Russia on the Baltic Sea. Now you would say, well, why don't they <clears throat> have a seaport uh, at St. Petersburg? Well, they, well, they do, they do, except that um, the Baltic Sea isn't quite as deep as it should be over there for any large vessels. So they need something like this as well as, as a main import export place. Now, <clears throat> if you are going to uh, have any changes whatsoever, they must get approval from NATO or EU which is rather interesting that they have that kind of control over this area. So the Baltic fleet headquarters is there for Russia. And that's one of, that's its main building. They got a few other buildings there as well. This, the house of the Soviets is a prominent building in Kaliningrad, And so is this church. So, <clears throat> Well, Belarus, 11% Russian, hmm, Roman Catholic, 49%, and <clears throat> as well as uh, Belarus and uh, Orthodox. Again, take a look where it's at. This capital Minsk is at that particular point. It's known as White Russia. Maybe you've heard of that before. And note where the capital happens to be. And as a consequence, this particular area has to be crossed by Kaliningrad if they want to furnish material to Russia. So Russia really wants to have uh -huh. Belarus as part of its, its kingdom. I say use the word kingdom because they want that empire. Belarus minx. The landlocked, independent since 1990, two official languages, Belarusian or Russian, both are official for them. A third of the population was lost in World War II, and they want you to know about that too. So they built quite a monument for that in, uh, in Minsk. That monument represents all those that were lost. So, um, <clears throat> along with the church, Mary Magdalene is important to these people in Minsk. The Russian Orthodox, Christianity is the official re religion. Roman Catholic is the most popular one. White Russian, that is a term that is used for um, Christianized Slavs and, pag and pagan bolts, the people that moved in to that area. And one of their churches. Monks has, Minks has a important government house, but notice that it has a linen statue in front, rather important to them, okay? The official language is thinking about joining Russia. And this is a few years ago. And I'm not sure whether it's still thinking about joining Russia. Um, this last year, I, I, I can't, uh, I don't have any information as they still have that idea or not. But the term Russ 
happens to be a term of a tribe. Uh, and of course, that's where Russia comes from. It's an ancient tribe that Belarus belongs to the Rus tribe, just like Russia. And so there are Rus bands at Kiev, Novgorod, and Moscow. And uh, Novgorod and Moscow and a few of these are going to become important next week when we discuss that. The Old Norse term meaning the men who row. This term, Verenigan, uh, came involved with Belarus because Belarus was having trouble controlling the tribes, the local tribes. So as a consequence, they imported some people from the Baltic uh, area. Um, the Verigan people lived outside of this Baltic Sea area. Or, and uh, they were imported then to keep order. <clears throat> and as a consequence, we'll find that they now are important in a number of cities. These are descendants from Eastern European Slavs. And then if you look at this map, take a look at the red little cities. And that's where the Verigan uh, people really settled and sort of took over because they were keeping order in the local population. And then another group, also the Kazai, um, the Turkish influence, are more in that blue area, as you can see. We're moving now to Ukraine, and you've heard so much about Ukraine, uh, what's happening presently and so forth. You got a lot more information from um, from the news than you get from me on what's happening there. But on the other hand, maybe we can see some reasons why these things are happening. Seventeen percent Russian. Do you want to take over or not? At least they have the uh, Orthodox Christianity of thirty percent. Kiev is the capital, and I want to point out there, if I can, uh, you see the arrow, the black arrow over there, and right above it is Chernobyl, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and right, ab uh, right above that is the line into Belarus, and that little um, prep preparat river is where they had an awful lot of damage once the Chernobyl um, ex explosion occurred, the meltdown. All right, that's a quick picture of the Ukraine. And this is probably the latest picture that I could get. Notice the red is the current war zone. Uh, the Crimea it's down there on the bottom, as you can see. It's controlled by Russia now. And then, uh, however, the green, you all have all these protests going on in that area. So this is all part of this Ukraine problem. Most of it now is in the area toward the, um, the east. And whether that increases or not, we will find out, I guess, as the war goes on. Taking a look at Ukraine, because it's so important to Russia, here's the climate that it goes with. Once again, notice the blue. The blue is the temperate climate that is the same as ours right here. And uh, you will find that across the whole country of Ukraine, and it's very important to its products and everything else. Now, <clears throat> if you take a look at a place like um, in this area, uh, Moscow is on the same lane, area, latitude, should I say, as this particular area. And if you compare uh, Moscow with Minneapolis and their Total uh, temperatures through the year 
you could really superimpose one on the other. It's virtually the same. So then you get you, it gets you a feel as to what they are feeling over there. Okay. And as a consequence, that's a very good place to go. Wheat and grain of various kinds. Uh, and of course, they've been exporting a lot of that from this particular area. Now, why would Russia be interested in Ukraine? Well, at one time they were very interested. Here you have two people who are considered Ukrainians, Khrushchev and Brezhnev. Khrushchev was born in, <clears throat> in one of the cities in Ukraine. Brezhnev was just on the border of Belarus, and but lived most of his life in the Ukraine also. So Ukraine is very important to these people, these Russians. They want to be a part of Russia rather than a separate thing. So whether Putin believes that that's the way he's got to go, I don't know, but well, in this particular <clears throat> Kiev war memorial is this, the great patriot uh, statue. And we'll find out the various other statues as we go along here to the war that happened in World War II, particularly. So <clears throat> there's something called the Kiev and Rus. Ukraine and Russia have the strong ties with similar heritage. Hmm. Ukrainian is the official language. Russian minority wants Russian as its first official language. So you see these ties coming through all the time between those two. And maybe that's why they feel they should be part of, uh, Russia wants to make sure Ukraine is a part of them. It's a good question. And I don't have an answer. Ukraine has the largest Russian diaspora in the world. How many of you know your Ukrainians here? Yeah, we've got a few people. Okay, Joe. Yeah. So um, let's take a look at where they are. Ukraine has the largest uh, Russian diaspora in the world, 1.8 million. 550,000 are in the United States, as of the last count anyway, and about 100,000 in Canada, 200,000 in Argentina. So they go various places and where else, I'm not sure where to make up the 1.8 million. So more than 3 million have fled in the recent, um, in the recent war, so. Gives you a little feel as to where some of these Kiev and Rus are, are in Russia. So they're kind of in that pink area or orange, orangish area that <clears throat> the tribes are very strong in that particular region. And they have some uh, area that they really love to memorialize. And these are the uh, monastery caves in Eastern part of Europe, rather colorful. You can say that this is true, the breadbasket of the USSR, except now that's just the breadbasket of Ukraine. Chernozem is that black soil, that black soil that you, it's most fertile in the world. And then if you wanna go find it, you can find it in Iowa and Nebraska here, and so forth. And some in Indiana, that area, that black soil that produces a very good growth for crops. So as you can see, they had some modern machinery here that they can harvest their wheat. And uh, I'm not sure what they're harvesting yet. It looks almost like, it might be wheat, although it's not dark enough in my, uh, looks more like an oats kind of thing. So maybe somebody knows better. 
Well, let's not leave Ukraine yet. <clears throat> and you'll see that uh, Sastopol, you can find that down here, here, and Yalta is in that particular spot. Yalta was a place of the big three meeting, the big three. And who are they? Well, these guys. Crimea and Yalta Conference, Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin. All right, they were in this particular place. And now uh, Russia has claimed Ukraine or uh, Crimea for itself. So Zastopol and Ukraine, in this picture, they still had the fleet of both Ukraine and Russia in the harbor. And now this the Russians control it. Levedia is the palace in which this conference is held. <clears throat> now, a little picture to show exactly where Chernobyl is and Priapiat is next to it and that's where the, the um, meltdown occurred. Picture of Chernobyl and the area next to it. It's right next to Belarus. And of course, as you can see, Ukraine and Belarus has that border line right there. And that's the type of destruction that occurred when the radiation uh, was spilled out over the countryside. Ah. Huh. A little place, Moldova, Moldova, 13% Russian, but Eastern Orthodox is 46%. So we're still in that category. Chesanu is the capital. And they have some famous gates that if you are on tourism, we can see that. But this is the nice area, the wheat, grain, and wine country, rather important to the area. And of course, they export plenty of wine. So city looks like that. But they are famous for this particular wine. All right. I shouldn't ask well, how many of you have been drinking it, but uh, Georgia. 6% <clears throat> Russian, Georgian, Russian, orth the orthodontic is 40%. This is the first time you see a percentage on Muslim, okay, in Georgia. The um, Last uh, last month, uh, one of the, <clears throat> the servers at Freedom Village, where I live, uh, came in back from Georgia. She was um, a late teenager, I would say, had just come back from the Ukraine and had been, but her people were all from Georgia, but her particular uh, residence today is here in West Ottawa. So, because uh, her parents are here. But uh, she could make it okay all the way to Georgia back again, even though she was really quite worried about getting back from the Ukraine. <clears throat> Pretty happy to be back here in the United States. Georgia. Uh, Tbilisi, the capital. And they have a rather interesting range of mountains in the Caucasus in this particular part of Georgia. Casello uh, Tushita happens to be a tower that was built many years ago, 1230 12, 12, uh, BC. 
uh, in that year as a safety area for the locals against the Mongols that were invading the area. And that little building there that you see, okay. Yeah, this one here, we'll show some more of them in a moment. Uh, were safe places. They could get into these buildings and then be safe at least from the Mongols. 13 towers still remain today. And in fact, uh, some Dutch entrepreneur decided that they should re be rebuilt. And so these have been rebuilt as memories to uh, posterity, I guess. These buildings used for safety. This is sort of a mixed up map insofar as you see where Georgia is, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. But Armenia is also located a little bit inside of Azerbaijan. I can get that pictured here. So um, the um, a little bit of Armenia is inside of Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan has a little bit on the other side, uh, down here, that over here, that is really in part of Armenia. So they evidently get along pretty well together because they cross the lines without too much trouble. And again, you see where the little bitty of Azerbaijan is located right there. Well, what about Armenia? One percent Russian only. You see, when the Russians took over all these various satellites that they had before, they did have their civil servants go in to, and be a part of the system. And as a consequence, they left quite a few Russians there. Well, in this particular case, not very many. Armenia is really a Christian country. Six to five percent of them. Mount Ararat? Hmm. I'm not so sure that that is a correct picture inside there. Is that the Ark? Well, <laughs> that must have been a painting. Okay, but that's what the country looks like. It's really beautiful in many ways, and Armenians think so too. Oh, what happened here? Hmm. Well, you got your quiz all done? It's hard to read the answers, so I will shoot them off to you, okay? Oh, again? How does it start off? 15 countries. Oh boy, I have the wrong answers here. I was. Hmm. So I don't have the right quiz out there. So this doesn't match that, does it? What you had, I, I was almost sure you did. That's not the right one. Did I pull the wrong one out? Mm -hmm. Otherwise we'll just go on with it.
Uh, hmm. What does it start out with? 15 countries. 15 countries. Oh. Well, then this is that's not the same one there, right? Okay, 15 countries. Here we go. Uh, 15 countries is G. Uh, George, am I right? Uh, see, I knew Ron would catch me again with something wrong here. Is it? All right. G. Is in George. Number two is K, is in King. Number three is H, is in How. Number four is Nan. Number five is Love. Six is Abel. Seven is Obo. O, O is in Obo. Eight is B, is in Baker. Nine is P as in Peter. 10 is C as in Charlie. And 11 is R as in Roger. Uh, 12 is E as in Easy. 13 is N as in Mike. 14 is J as in Jig. 15 is D as in Dog. And 16 is F as in Fox. Well, did I make it through that one? Let's see what the next, next one is like then. Anything, any comments or questions or? We move on. Which two starts with Moscow? The next one starts with Moscow. Thank you for that info. I better have that here. Aha, uh -huh, I do. <laughs> Great. All right. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I see I must have sub forgot to supplant the one with the other. Okay, good. Azerbaijan. Continue that whole way. Big city there. Baku. Big city for those people over there. It is the oil city. It is on the Caspian Sea. Okay, we got a little idea. Lots of oil there next to the Caspian Sea. But before I get to the Caspian Sea, I have to at least talk about some of these rivers. Go ahead. Yes, I was in Azerbaijan and Baku. Okay. Yes, yeah. If you got a story to tell, by all means, give it to us. Yes, I was in uh, Baku in Azerbaijan in June for the Formula One auto race. Oh. Took my grandson there. Oh. Uh, but they do not get along with Armenians too well. As a matter of fact, there's been a war going on since 2021. And we're advised not to talk about Armenia. Wonderful. Thank you for that contribution. I really appreciate that. Okay. All right. See whether I'm got anything correct here or not. We'll find out. All right. <clears throat> we got to get through uh, this particular uh, route. That's why I have to go back to the major rivers here. Volga is one of them. Moscow is connected to the Volga by a canal. All right. The Volga drains into the Caspian Sea. That's what the connection I'm trying to get at. The Don flows into the Sea of Azov and then back into the uh, Black Sea, which gives us the outing to the world. All right. So the Volga Don Canal allows access to getting into the Black Sea and then to the other, to the outside world. This is the Caspian Lake, <clears throat> or is it a Caspian Sea? And the discussion has been going on for years between the countries over there. If it is a lake, then the center part 
is owned jointly by every, all the uh, surrounding countries. If it is considered a sea, then you can have uh, rights of coastline rights. So I don't know which, which is which, but <coughs> as far as the Caspian Sea is concerned, um, it is quite a center also for the oil industry. So consider the crossword for Western Asia and Eastern Europe. Okay, now take a little look at this one. See where Volgograd is? That little green thing there is the canal. The canal that connects those two. So if you, go, if you don't want to go into the Caspian Sea, you can continue to, to go over to uh, the, in the canal to the Don and into the Azov and get you outside world. Again, take a look at the possible route you would have to take in order to do that. That red line does show you uh, to get out into the Black Sea and then into the Mediterranean. And this shows a little bit better <clears throat> how you go from one to the other. And um, the whole idea is to get into the Black Sea if at all possible to get out to, into the Mediterranean that way. So if you are, uh, how did you get to Baku? You, you flew into there. Yeah, okay, all right, interesting, okay. He flew into, it. that's how he got to Baku. I'm repeating so that those out there can hear. <clears throat> Again, takes a nice little look here at how you can get from the uh, Caspian out into the Mediterranean with your oil. A little closer picture of the canal and the various uh, route that you have to take at the Volga and the Don. Okay. Noticing at this particular, I put in there fighting along the borders at, as of this day right now, as far as that's concerned, between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. But we're going to first look at um, Kazakhstan. Before I leave that one, uh, see the term Astana in the middle? That is the capital. However, <clears throat> this map, and rightly does, shows that the capital is Alma Almaty, uh, which is down there near the border. And they have now changed that because the local tribes decided that they would much rather have uh, their own area shown up, and it's called Astana. Okay. I'll get to that again in a little bit, but take take a look. 30% Russian. And why so many Russians? Well, we'll see in a moment. The Sunni Muslims are 47% Russian Orthodox, 8%. Here is the old uh, uh, governmental area in, uh, in uh, Almaty. Now it has moved to Astana, which is also known as Nur Sultan, which is their local tribe's name. And they're rather proud of that particular name, although that hasn't appeared on the map, maps yet, <clears throat> more recently. But what does Afghanistan have? Oh, not Af Kazakhstan. I got to get my stands correctly. Well, this is the Lodge lost place for the satellites, the Russian satellites. That's why Russia wants to hang on to uh, Kazakhstan. So you have a picture of the <clears throat> kind of a steppe region, which is close to desert, uh, and the locals living in a yurt. But notice they also have a place for the launching of a satellite. 
Lekanur, Cosmodrome, is the center for Russian satellite uh, launching. So they have to go outside the country in order to put their people into the space area. The launch pad is close to the as close to the equator as possible to take advantage of the Earth's rational uh, uh, rotational speed in easterly direction, which happens to be 465 miles per second. So they can get that <clears throat> into the orbit that way. It's amazing. So they do not want to leave, leave uh, lose uh, Kazakhstan because that's where they're their uh, launch plan happens to be. We move to Uzbekistan, not tremendously noticeable uh, of note, but there is a particular thing that has happened in this particular country. Uzbekistan has two rivers, and maybe I don't know how well you can see that on this map, because they're just small lines. One is up toward the top, and the other is down here. They're called the uh, Sir Duria, and um, the other one is Amu Duria. Duria. And I better point out over here, too. Where's my. Here we go. This line here. And this line here. In the middle here is desert, very much desert. Well, one of the things the Russians decided is that they got water. There's water that runs into the Aral Sea. Oh, I see. Those two rivers enter both the Aral Sea. Both of them enter the Aral Sea. Why don't we use that water and use this land between? for the, the growth of cotton and various things. Use that water for irrigation. Well, they did. And as a big uh, project, one of their big projects, there's several of them, the central planning, they decided to um, take the water that was going down the rivers and raise cotton and so forth. Well, as a consequence, they're taking that water out of the area. Uh, the shoreline of that Oral Sea gets less and less and less, so that the river, the Oral Sea, really it becomes almost unusable at all. But originally, they did think that was a wonderful place, and they built a big fishing can, cannery and the like to process the fish that came out of there. And it was very successful, except now all of a sudden they're finding out that things are drying up. And this particular building is now abandoned. They kept getting fish from elsewhere to process. Once the oral seeds tend to dry up, this didn't make any sense at all. So finally, they just closed. Central planning is what did that. And you'll find that a couple of other places. We'll talk about that, uh, if not yet today, tomorrow or next week uh, for the aluminum plants that uh, have been um, producing and why they produce the way out there. So the whole idea is, yeah, let's produce as much as we can and particularly all over the country of Russia. So as a consequence, Uzbekistan has lost an awful lot. It irrigated fertile cotton growing region in the Soviet mass expansion of canals in this particular country of Uzbekistan. And that's what the sea is starting to look like. And if you notice, you can see a couple of ships, small, I guess they're ships, uh, small boats anyway, that are dried up. They're on the border, they're abandoned. So that particular project didn't work out very well, other than, yeah, the cotton grows very well. 
with the fish still. Turkmenistan, not too much to say about that one, but notice, wow. Yeah, 6% Russian, but Sunni. Now we have a lot of the Sunni Muslim there, 87%. <clears throat> and that does have a large desert there that is just not very usable at all. Karakum happens to be the name of that desert. And, and, but they have some pretty good buildings in their capital in the, of Ashgabat. And then the next one is Kyrgyzstan, 13% Russian, mm -hmm. Muslim, 75%. And if you see, take a look there, one of the important lakes is Lake uh, Esikol. That particular one keeps the area around it fairly warm in spite of it being in the mountains, like uh, the mountains of the Tishen Mountains. So that particular area then is, uh, allows growth of a very different kinds of <clears throat> uh, vegetables and the like. Here's the capital of it, Kyrgyzstan, not terribly important. <clears throat> but uh, Tajikistan is another one, so the last one involved. The Sunni Muslims there are 85%, okay. Fergana Valley seems to be a rather rich valley, and as a consequence, uh, it furnishes a lot of the local food for those people. Cotton, fruit, raw silk, and the like. But we got to remember that in this area, they need a monument for a lot of things. Seminid is uh, an old, old, old tribe, and then the tribe of Tajiks <clears throat> did want to have a monument for that. So here we have a monument for that particular tribe. Now, just as a summary, and I don't know how well this will show, each count country has its own language. However, they all can use Russian. Russian used to occupy each country and settle a number of Russians to help run the country, okay? The percent of Russians left in each country varies from two to 35%. Now, that's kind of a quick look at this chart, which is hard to read, but uh, I point out that in this particular list, uh, Kazakhstan has a population of 15 million and 30% uh, are Russian. So it gives you an idea for the, now this group, again, the biggest uh, population for Russian, it happens to be, um, well, the biggest population is Ukraine, but Latvia and so forth has the biggest percentage um, <clears throat> of people that are Russian. Little idea there. Well, we're moving. We're moving off to the deepest freshwater lake in the world, Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal. It's the Pearl of Siberia. We'll be looking at that one again next week. The deepest, uh, it is 5,300 feet deep. However, if you go by sea level, then the deepest part is only 4,215 feet below sea level. So take those two things into consideration. It's the largest fresh freshwater lake by volume. Which one is the largest lake? What we have one here in the United, United States. Well, this one 
Lake Baikal holds 20% of the world's fresh water. However, we can't let ours go by you know, over here, Lake Superior. Lake Superior has the largest freshwater lake in the world by surface area. So it's, uh, but the fourth largest by volume. So that Lake Baikal is really deep and it's part of a uh, meeting of two earth plates that causes this great big rift. So Lake Baikal is the largest by volume. And there, a picture of two plates. And you see the North American plate is hitting the Eurasian plate. And at that particular point, the, uh, there's enough uh, of a fault line in there to cause Lake Baikal to be formed. <clears throat> the North American lake, as you can see with the yellow um, arrow, is touching the Eurasian plate. In fact, it's actually part of Russia. That whole plate serves in that area. And that, of course, is causing this big rift that is happening in uh, Lake Baikal. Here we have a few marks. As you can see, Japan is pretty well pushed by one particular fault after another. And as a consequence, you have that activity at those fault lines with volcanoes and earthquakes and so forth. All right, that's just a small amount of information on that. Let's move to a little bit of trivia. Volgograd is a city with a very large statue. It is called Mother Russia. It is 170 feet tall. This means that it is 25 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. That's on the other side. This one in the room. The <laughs> second one down from Moscow is St. Petersburg. Uh, number two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, th I think this was just added on. Okay. And, uh, okay, the, uh, the Far East, that's, well, this means that the Mother of Russia was 25 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty, okay? Dagestan has about 33 ethnic groups. It's rather interesting too. Yeah, they have mostly women in their, uh, in their parliament, so to speak. And then Bratsk has an hydroelectric power, which we will talk about next time too, which produces the aluminum. And as a consequence, we find uh, a place by, like Vogograd here in that small little map and the big statue. It's a city with a very large statue. It is called Mother Russia. It is 170 feet tall. That means it is 25 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. <clears throat> and looks like that. The mother calls. The motherland calls. Mother Russia. It is in memory of one million <clears throat> soldiers caught, killed in World War II. 70,000 were killed in Stalingrad from Volgograd. It's amazing how many. Mother Russia honors those killed in that war. And that's what it looks like. We got a little dog there, so you get a little bit of the perspective as to how big this thing is. Okay. Now. This guy lost his shirt. This guy is super strong. Now, what did I do? 
He's, that's the wrong one. Do we start with my Moscow? Oh. Yeah, all right, then I've got it. So let's go through them a moment. Number one is Charlie. Two is Fox. Three is uh, Howe. Four is King. Five is Love. Six is Jig. Seven is Abel. Eight is Mike. Nine is Baker. Ten is Nan. Eleven is Obo. Twelve is Easy. And thirteen is Baker. Fourteen is Brosk, George, and fifteen is Dog. Now, how many did I miss on that one? All of them? Well, I thought, all right. The, the one that shows up there does not show on your, on your quiz? No, it does. Okay. All right. All right. Is that? Well. Any uh, any comments you want to to make at this point? Any questions or, or things that have happened to you as far as Russia is concerned? Here we go. We, we have this young man over here. Uh, yeah, it's just really interesting. Uh, I do have a a friend who is from the eastern part of Ukraine, and uh, he was in the Russian army uh, as an engineer. And he's very loyal to Russia. And he was very, very disappointed when uh, it became Ukraine because he had spoken Russian and it became mandated that everyone learn to speak Ukrainian instead of Russian. And uh, he was one of the few that did speak Ukrainian. So he had to teach people how to speak Ukrainian in the area where he lived. There was also a lot of false news regarding the SS uh, being on the, from where he lived they had been told that the SS was still very active in the Western section of the country. Now, again, that could very easily have been fake news, but uh, he believed it. Well, thank you very much for that, <clears throat> bringing us up to date, especially if you know a few people that are actually Ukrainians that are here and know what they're, yeah. Anybody else on that? That's great, appreciate that. Okay, Lee's got something over there. <clears throat> Just a comment that area in the eastern part of the Soviet uh, Russia, that was a big conflict about, oh, maybe 20 years ago between China and Russia over the iron ore and the oil and the coal in the area. They, that, and I don't think that's ever been settled and might still be an area of big contention between China and Russia. Oh, okay. Also, the Armenians, as you know, are largely in Iran and Turkey also. Right. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Lee's, Lee's got his information on that. I appreciate that too. Okay. Well, I didn't forgot to look at my watch. Are we up on time? Okay. So it's, it's always hard to uh, uh, try to figure out how long this is going to take. You know? You're perfect. Okay. 15 minutes before 11. Uh, thank you very much for attending today. Be sure to return back same time next Monday for a part two. Uh, Have a great day. <laughs>